My name is Todd Malone, and it is a pleasure to be here with you. I want to highlight a couple of things. First off, if you are contemplating whether or not you want your kids to go to VBS, send them. Um, it, this, I'm really excited about this year. I'm excited because I get to wear the t-shirt. Um, but I'm also excited because the theme this year, what it's actually talking about, is that God is good regardless of our circumstances. So often, we inadvertently teach children that God is good because things turn out our way. And that's not the measure of God's goodness. And this VBS really drives that home. I'm very excited about that. Uh, also, I want to um, give you a save this date. Uh, July 14th, we are going to have a church-wide kind of prayer and worship dinner. And we're going to follow that up with a 40 days of prayer. And as, as I've shared in the past, when the Lord is going to supply what, he need, what we need to accomplish what he has called us to do. And so when giving goes down, the question to ask is not um, panic, how do we manipulate people? It's what is God doing and how do we respond? And so that's, we're going to enter into prayer over that. Um, and let me just say, I am so thankful that the electricity went back on. I think AC is still making its way up to the stage, but I'm in a t-shirt, so that's okay. Well, I think I've shared this story before. If I have, it's been a while. Um, my dad was born a con artist and a practical joker, and that is a very, very, very dangerous combination. When my dad was probably seven years old, and his little sister, my Aunt Lynn, was five, my dad started telling my aunt stories about her brother, Tony. Tony was an amazing kid. He was just a blast to be with. Everyone loved Tony, and he had all these stories about Tony. And at some point, it occurs to a five-year-old to ask the question, why have I never met my brother Tony? And my dad was ready for that question. My dad explained that Tony got in trouble. And when Tony got in trouble, mom and dad put him out with the garbage. And the garbage man took him away. Now, I'm hearing the gasps of horror. Think about what that did to a five-year-old little girl. So at some point, the trauma and grief got too much for her. And she came running to my grandmother, absolutely sobbing. My grandmother's trying to know what in the world is wrong, and what she can get out is, I miss Tony. <laughs> and somewhere along the way, she explained that she didn't want to be taken by the garbage man either. Now, the great thing about that story, of course, is that she couldn't miss Tony because Tony never existed. My dad made Tony up just to mess with his little sister. And the real stroke of genius was that he had a solution for why Tony wasn't anywhere to be seen. I would like to be able to tell you that as my dad grew up, he grew out of that. No. <laughs> no, he didn't. And despite the fact that there is a good news and a bad news to having a father that um, is both a con artist and a practical joker, he was very loved by his family. Um, despite some things that came out of those qualities that were not as good. What do you think of when you think of family? It can be complicated, isn't it? For some of us, our background is a very, very healthy family. 
For some of us, our background is a family that is loving and supporting and is encouraging. But even in that context, we know the pain, the frustration, the disappointment that comes with being in family. For some of you, your background is very different, and your background of family is very dysfunctional and is very hurtful, and what you think of is the pain more than you think of the joy. But even in those cases, so often there is that longing for the love, the connection, the bond that should exist within a family. And isn't it interesting that the New Testament often speaks of our relationships within the church in terms of family? Families are not perfect. They come complete with frustration and anger and disappointment. But there is a bond that is undeniable. And all of us long for that bond. And as we look at the image of the church as family, we see that this bond exists among the people in this room. This is our second sermon in the summer series called Define the Relationship. This is a series that is looking at how we are to relate with one another. What is to be true of us as a church? And last week what we saw is that Jesus is the one who is building the church and he is building it on the foundation of the gospel. And this week we are going to add to that. Jesus is building the church as a family on the foundation of the gospel. And we will look at Paul's statement about the church in 1 Timothy 3, where he calls the household of God. And this is one of the key passages in the book. Much of the book, both before and after this passage, is dealing with very practical matters of how people relate to one another, what leadership would look like, and things like that. But he takes a break right in the middle of the book, this very short break, to say, this is the thinking, the reasoning this is why we should act the way that I am telling us we should act in 1 Timothy. You see, because they are a household, we're going to see that the church has a family identity. The church has a family assignment, and the church has what I'm calling a family motto. And after looking at these things, I want us to consider the implications for FBC. But let's start with a family identity. Now, 1 Timothy 3, 15 is one of the New Testament passages that defines the church as a family. That's what is meant by household of God. Timothy's point in verse 15 is that there are certain ways that the Ephesians should conduct themselves. These are the ways that he's been laying out in the book so far and that he will lay out in the rest of the book. There are ways that they should conduct themselves because they are family under God's leadership. Now, one of the mistakes that we make when we come to the New Testament and reread about family is that we take our picture of family and we transport it back into their time period. Our families don't look the way their families looked. Our families tend to be much smaller units. In the first century, families often functioned as small businesses. Families would have multiple generations under the same household, in the same, in the same building. They would have all their employees that would live with them under the same roof. And those employees, quite frankly, were usually slaves. So when you come to certain passages in the New Testament and you see what are called the household codes, you will notice it talks about how fathers should relate to to children, how mothers should relate to children, how husband and wife should relate to one another, and we'll talk about how slaves should relate to the family. That's because they were all considered part of the household, part of the family. When someone who would hear this or read this in the first century, when they came across household of God, they would picture a group of probably about 25 people, all living together under the same roof. And it was very clear that they were all dependent upon one another. And it was very clear that they looked to the father of the family to provide and protect them. For Paul to call the church the household of God would have meant that God is the authority. He is the provider. He is the protector. And everyone in that household has an intimate relationship with one another. And they all depend on one another to perform their function both within the family and its related business. Whether that be farming or being a merchant or whatever it was. 
Their identity was wrapped up in the fact that they were part of the father's household. If you ask someone in that family what their identity was, they would very likely connect that to belonging to the father and belonging to that father's household. We actually saw a reference to that in last week's passage. Remember what Jesus called Peter? Simon Barjona. That means Simon, son of Jonah. That's how Peter was identified in that society. You were identified by your father. So this is important. They would identify as being a child of their father and in their household. And this is what would unite them together as a household and it would determine what was expected of their behavior. We have a very powerful living example of this within our household. Our daughter Sarah was raised well. She was a Cowboys fan. And then she married into a family of Packer fans. I say that my wife is a Packers fan, but you didn't hear that from me. Um, One day, her new father-in-law sat down with her and had the talk. And he started by saying, we as Haydens do not have cross-dressers in our family. It is not acceptable for you to wear a Cowboys jersey and a Packers hat just to try to make everyone happy. (laughs) It is not okay when babies come for you to put that baby in a Packers onesie and Cowboys booties. We are not cross-dressers in the Hayden family. He was laying out for her. There is certain conduct that is acceptable and certain conduct that isn't. And pretty much any conduct involving the Dallas Cowboys was not acceptable if you were going to be a Hayden. Another way of thinking about that is what Dan was saying to her is that her lead identity was no longer as a Cowboys fan. Now her lead identity was that she was a Hayden. And being a Hayden meant that certain things were acceptable and certain things were not. Being a Hayden was more important. It always trumped being a Cowboys fan. She is a Hayden first. And that is what is going on in this passage with Paul. When he tells them, he tells the Ephesians that they are the household of God, they are children of God is what he is saying. He is saying that you are, you are to catch That being a child of God means that God is your father and he protects you and provides for you. But what we often miss when we talk about the household of God and we talk about being children of God is that it also means that we are in relationship with one another. Being a child of God automatically and unavoidably makes us and made them members of the family of God. And the Ephesians are not first Jews or Gentiles. They are not first Romans or Ephesians. They are not first husbands or wives or farmers or merchants. They are first and foremost God's children and members of his family. That is what will define them. And that is our identity as well. Individually, we are children of God, but corporately, we are also automatically brought into identity with God's family. Our lead identity is that as children of God, we are part of his family. How would it change our relationships with one another if we led with the fact that we are all part of the family of God? How would it change our relationships if our lead identity was that we are brothers and sisters in Christ first and members of a political party second? If we are brothers and sisters in Christ first and second people of a certain type of school choice? If we are brothers and sisters first and people who have a preference for a certain type of music or a certain type of atmosphere second? 
it's worth it for us to pause and ask the question, what identity do you lead with? What identity do you lead with in your relationships with the people in this room? Are you first and foremost brother and sister in Christ? As Christians, we are first members of the household of the living God. And then Paul goes on to describe that being members of the household of God means that we have a family assignment. This is what is continued in verse 15. The church has a function. They are to be a pillar and buttress of the truth. This is a picture of pillars. Now, there are a couple of things that you should notice about the pillars. First, they're designed to hold something up. Second, they have a certain beauty and attractiveness in and of themselves. If you ever visit a site like this, one of the things you look at and notice is, aren't those pillars amazing? Aren't those pillars beautiful? You see, the pillars are designed to bear part of the load of the building, and they're also designed to bring out beauty within the building. And that is what the church is supposed to do with the truth. We are to lift up the truth. We are to make it visible. And in the context where it's talking about the church as a household, we are to make the church visible by our intimate bonds with one another. This picture shows a series of buttresses. Buttresses are designed to support the weight of a wall. Now, some of your translations will say foundation. Either one is a perfectly legitimate translation. The word that's being translated refers to something that bears weight. And the idea that Paul has is that we as the church are to be a strong support. We're to be a firm basis for believing the truth of the gospel. Pillars and buttresses. The church is to be God's household for a reason. The church is to make the truth truth of the gospel visible. And it's to provide support. It's to provide a reason for believing that truth. We are to make the truth visible and compelling. This is how the world will know what life with God looks like. a theologian named N.T. Wright who has this quote. I actually have this on my whiteboard in my office. The problem is not that people don't believe in God, but they, they, they cannot imagine what a world dominated by God would look like, would be like. See, the problem isn't that we have a bunch of atheists running around who just refuse to believe in God. The problem is we have a bunch of people running around who have no picture whatsoever what life dominated by God is actually like. And what Paul is saying in these verses is that we are to be that picture. We are to show them in how we relate to one another what a life dominated by God looks like. We are to show them what it looks like to be so committed to one another that disagreements don't cause us to talk about each other behind our backs. We are to be so committed to one another that we can hang in there with each other when things get hard. We are so committed to one another that we sacrifice for each other and for the well-being of one another. Verse 15 calls us to show people what a world dominated by God would be like by being the family of God. It's interesting that more and more churches are getting away from the idea of we're going to do evangelism by doing big events, inviting people in. More and more churches are adopting the mindset that what we need to do is we need to be in relationship with one another in front of our non-Christian friends and relatives. So one of the things and something that I'm going to encourage us to do as a church moving forward For a lot of these churches, what they will do is their small groups, their small groups will go out and do service projects together. But it's not just them. When they go out and do a service project together, they're inviting their non-Christian friends because they want their non-Christian friends to see this is what Christians look like in relationship with one another and serving the world. And they won't stop there. They'll invite their non-Christian friends to a dinner. 
They'll invite their non-Christian friends to be a part of the life of that small group in very meaningful ways. So those non-Christian friends are saying, you guys are different from all the other relationships in my life. Why are you different? And the answer to that question is because we are part of the family of God. We are part of the household of the living God. We have a lead identity. We are to be the household of the living God. We are a family. We have an assignment that comes with that identity. We are to make the truth of the gospel visible and compelling in how we relate to one another. But we also have a family motto. We have a belief that defines us and that guides us. So kids, we need your help with this one. I've got some characters up here and part of their motto that they're famous for. Who is this? And what does he say? To infinity and beyond. Who's this? What does he say? Hulk Smith. He's not very articulate. Um, Who's this? Paw Patrol. What do they say? No job is too big. No pup is too small. These sayings are their mottos. They tell you something about the people or the pups who say them. Buzz Lightyear is an explorer. Hulk has limited speaking abilities and he breaks things. (laughs) Paw Patrol is constantly saving Adventure Island. Adventure Bay, (laughs) which is attached to Adventure Island, which is in Adventure Sea. Um, (laughs) Verse 16, and you thought the brick thing was tough. Um, (laughs) Verse 16 is the motto for the household of God. It's part of a hymn. We actually don't have the whole hymn. But Paul takes this part of the hymn and he says, this is what defines us. And it's interesting how he introduces this hymn. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. So often what we think of godliness is as just following the rules. Here's a list of things that we do. Here's a list of things that we don't do. But Paul says it's a mystery. And that's because it's grounded in relationship. It's grounded in the relationship that we enjoy with the Christ who is described in the rest of verse 16. So let's break down what he actually says about Jesus. It starts with he was manifested in the flesh. This means that Jesus was revealed when he became human. So it's actually affirming two things. It's affirming that Jesus existed before he became human. He existed with the Father in eternity. And then he became human. He lived in the flesh. Second, Jesus was vindicated by the Spirit. This means that the Holy Spirit affirmed Jesus' mission. The Holy Spirit opens hearts to the reality that Jesus lived as a perfect, sinless person. He died on the cross to take our sins, and he was raised from the dead three days later. Third, Jesus was seen by the angels. Even the unseen spiritual world has witnessed who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. Jesus was and is proclaimed among the nations. The seen world has heard about Jesus. Jesus was and is believed on in the world. In other words, the proclamation in the nations about who Jesus is and what he has accomplished will be believed. People from all nations will respond to the good news of Jesus by by dedicating their lives to being more like him. Jesus was taken up in glory. Jesus returned to the glories of heaven where he reigns. This hymn captures the entire gospel. This hymn captures the life and ministry of Jesus and its impact on heaven and earth. This is the truth that the church is to hold up and to affirm by how we relate to one another. This is the gospel that unites us and gives us a shared identity. It's tempting at this point to say, shame on us. We need to work harder and be united with one another. But that actually gets things in the wrong order. 
The Bible is making it clear here that we are already unified. And the truth that, this, that is expressed in this hymn is that it is the gospel, it is the work of Jesus that has done the unification for us. We have a lot of families in this church who are involved in adoption. When a child is adopted into a family, it's not just adopted into a relationship between the child and the parents. That adopted child is now in relationship with all the other siblings. They are all bound together by the fact that they are all in the family. How weird would it be if the kids came to mom and dad one day and said, you know, we talked about it, we decided we're going to work hard so that someday we can be a family. Mom and dad would say, no, you have it backwards. You have it wrong. You are a family. That work has been done. Being a family is a gift that you received from us. As parents, we support you and protect you and guide you and correct you and provide for you. We stick with you. It means that this is your home and these are your people. And what mom and dad want is that the siblings would develop that same sort of relationship with one another and would express those same qualities of caring and protecting and supporting and guiding and hanging in there with one another. And that they would endure with one another. And that's exactly how it's to work in the church. We are supposed to live out what God has done. He has made us a family. Our job isn't to make us into a family. It's to live as family because the gospel, the truth of verse 16, has made us a family. We have a lead identity. We are members of the household of God. And that identity leads to an assignment. We are to make the gospel visible and compelling through our relationships as family. We have a motto that defines us and guides us, and that motto is the gospel, the good news that Jesus came to earth to save us from our sin by dying on the cross. And he was raised three days later and now reigns in heaven. So what does this have to do with us? What does this have to do with the FBC family? Well, here's another great quote. This one from George Burns. Happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. <laughs> right, I think we can relate to that in some form, even within the household of God. We want a growing family, a loving and caring family. We want this family to be united. We're just not sure how we really want this family interacting with us. We're not sure what role we want to give this family in our lives. Well, let me make three points in reflecting on 1 Timothy 3. First, being in family means to be in relationship with specific people. That's actually what makes George Burns' joke so funny, is he wants a loving family that he doesn't have to relate to. But love doesn't happen in theory. It happens in concrete relationships. Paul writes this to a specific, identifiable church in the city of Ephesus with unique challenges and problems. He is not saying be a family in general with the Christians in Jerusalem or Rome. He wants them to be a family in the daily relationships with one another. We need to be in relationship with specific people. Second, Paul wants them to be in committed, long-term relationships. Can you imagine running into someone and having a conversation like this? Hey, I haven't seen you at the house in a while. What's up? Well, my dog and I have been family shopping. We're a little disappointed with the dinners. My daughter and I just aren't connecting well. Frankly, Spot and I just aren't having the experiences with the kids that we'd hoped for. So we're checking out other families to see if there's a better fit. What would you say to that person? You'd say to that person that you and Spot are in serious danger. First, you're in serious danger of hurting other people. The rest of the family counts on you. Second, you're in serious danger of hurting yourselves. There are some ways that you can grow only if you work through conflict and disappointment. Only if you set yourself in submission to others. 
further, the willingness to walk out on the family creates its own set of barriers in the family. The family's never going to invest emotionally if they think that you can just leave at any moment. And you know what? At some point, you would throw up your hands in exasperation at this person and say, buddy, family isn't just about you. But that is exactly how our culture views the relationships within the local church. They are disposable, and they are about what we get out of them. If I don't like what this household of God serves, I'm going to go find one that gives me what I want. And such thinking is very, very hard to justify if you view the family as Paul does, or view the church as Paul does, as a family. God wants us to say, this is where I belong, and I will work through all the muck to stay here. If you have ever done that with your family, if you've ever done that in close relationships, then you have experienced the result of that. You discover profound truths about yourself, about others, and about the Lord. And your love for all three deepens. Finally, consider making it clear. What do I mean by that? Church membership sadly, has become something in many churches that is very inappropriate. It's become like membership in a country club or a political party. Membership has become a way of creating the in crowd or gaining influence or getting something that you want. For leadership, it's become a way to pat themselves on the back because they're keeping score of how many members. And I hope those things never, ever, ever become the case at FBC. Membership in a healthy church is not modeled on being the member of a country club or Amazon Prime. It's modeled on being a member of a family. Church membership is supposed to be the way of making it clear which particular household you are committed to. Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus. The word membership isn't important to me, it's not in the Bible. If you don't call the people in your family members, if you call them something else, that's great. But what is important to me is that the concept of family relationship is in the Bible. It is important to me to invite people to be clear that there is a local household of God to whom they are committed and who is committed to them. I think it is important to be clear that the believer and the church affirm each other's shared identity in Christ that they are committed to seeing each other grow in that identity and that they won't just walk away from each other when things get hard or disappointing or people are let down. Obviously, there are ways to send this message without formally joining the church. You can make it clear that by showing up over time and being involved over time that you're part of that household, and that's very good. And if that's someone, and if there's someone that wants to do it that way, then I consider myself and I consider FBC blessed that they are a part of this church. But if the Lord starts putting on your heart that it would be good to make it very clear that you and FBC share an identity in Christ, that you are committed to the well-being of those at FBC, that you see FBC has a role in your walk with God, and that you are not just going to walk away, Don't dismiss that prompting. Consider how you can make it clear and if membership might be a way of doing that. We have a shared identity. We are members of the household of the living God. We have a shared assignment. Make the gospel visible and compelling. And we have a guiding motto, the gospel which unites us and directs us. And the point that Paul is making here in the point of this sermon is that our shared identity in Christ produces an intimacy, a bond with one another that is best captured in the word family. Some of the qualities that made my dad a great con artist and a practical joker got in the way of him being a good dad. 
And we spent most of my life apart. But despite the separation, there was always, always a commitment to each other. And we ended well. We worked through much of what separated us, not all of it. And we hung in there with one another. Commitment to the church is to be like commitment to family. Sometimes family can be a bit dysfunctional. So can the church. But it is a vital tool for transforming you as a child of God. So how do we respond? Suggest four ways. Here are some other passages that use the same terminology of household of God, and I would just encourage you to read through them and take note of what they say about how we are to relate to one another, what it means to be the household of God. Part of what happens as you are a member of the household of God is that you are changed, you are transformed because of your identity. Share with someone. Share with someone who's here this morning. Share with someone in your family. One way that you have been changed and transformed because of your identity in Christ. Make our unity as a family a matter of prayer. Remember the order. We are already unified as family. We don't have to pray that we would be family. We are family. But pray that that truth would be lived out in our relationships. And man, verse 16 is just this incredible, beautiful summary of the life of Christ and the truth of the gospel. What a wonderful verse to memorize. What a wonderful verse to have in your hip pocket, to be reminded of the amazing glory of who Jesus is that unites us together and brings you in relationship with the Lord. Let's close in prayer by celebrating the amazing, amazing Jesus who unites us. So I'd invite you to stand as we do that, and I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. And as they come forward, I just want to remind you that these are folks who are here to pray for you, no matter what you are facing, no matter what you are struggling. But boy, we certainly want to pray for you and introduce you to the Jesus who saves. Heavenly Father, You have done the work of bringing us to you. You have done the work of adopting us as your children. And even as you adopt us as your children, we recognize that you're adopting us not just into relationship with you, but you are adopting us into relationship with one another. That you have made us family. But Lord, we lose sight of that so easily. We, we treat each other like we're disposable. Lord, forgive us for that. Forgive us for treating each other in ways that we would never be okay if someone treated someone we love in our family. Forgive us of our selfishness and self-focus. But Lord, replace that with a love for you that overflows to a love for one another where we seek the well-being, the good, the flourishing of each other, just like we do within our family. Help us to do that, Lord, today. Help us to do that as we leave here. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. What have we said today about who God is? We have said this. God has made us into a family because of the gospel. So our challenge is to go Leave here and lead with that as our relationship with one another, that we are family. Make that be the lead in our relationship. You are dismissed.